Okay, so I'm going to carry on now with the build. I'm just going to wake up the PC. And there it is. Log in with the password set. And we're back to where we were. So we're going to carry on with package config. So this is really all we're going to be doing for several hours is, uh, well, maybe a couple of hours, hopefully. No, it might be several hours, come to think of it, because there'll be lots of tests to run. Um, just be a case of going through each package, each of the remaining packages, um, to compile and install each one in the methods shown for each in the book. So it extracts package config, run the configuration command, build it and now let's run the tests This is all test pass, so that's good. Nice, simple package and install it. And that's package config done. So move on now. Let's tidy up. And we'll remove, uh, sorry, extract and curses. Prepare it for configuration, uh, for compilation, sorry, with a configure command. Okay, and we'll build it. So that's complete. Now it says that the yeah, there is a test suite for this package, but it can only be run after the package has been installed. So we'll just go ahead and install it. Oh, the installation of the package will overwrite the event curse is in place. It may crash the shell process, which is in which is using the code and data from the library file. So install the package with Dester and replace the library file correctly using the install command. Use the static archive. Archive, which is not handled by configure, is also removed. So, a bit more of a complicated installation process with this then. So, you can see what they've done is that they've installed the package in another location. They've installed the correct uh, libn curses or the new libn curses um, in the correct location within the temporary location that was used here, this desk directory. And then it looks like what they're doing is they're removing the old um, library, is that right? 
install. Sorry, yeah, the, the, they're installing the new library, which is in the Desta, into the system. And then they're removing the just compiled library from the temporary directory so that it won't overwrite the new one. Um, it's been installed correctly using install. And then the remainder of the package is installed by copying from the temporary directory in, into the correct location in the system. Uh, many applications still expect the linker to be able to find non-wide characters. So trick the applications into linking with wide character libraries by means of symlinks and linker scripts. So we'll just copy this all as one command. There's several commands within the four, but this is designed to be run as one unit. Then finally make sure that old applications look for L curses at build time are still buildable. So it looks like we need to remove oops. Something else there. Remove the file. Set that file with some new information and then create a link to it. Then we can install some documentation. I always consider an installation, an operating system without documentation is incomplete. If you come across something you need to do, and you haven't got the documentation to hand, then you can't use the operating system. So that's why I think uh, an installation is incomplete without documentation, which is why I always tend to install it. Unless I've got good reason not to. Um, the instructions above don't create non wide character end curses libraries since no package installed by compiling from sources with links against them at runtime. Uh, basically, it's saying if you've got binary applications that need the non wide uh, characters, they require version, uh, version 5. But if you have such libraries, because of some binary only application, you can build the uh, this package again using these commands here. So we're not going to do that because uh, we're just sticking to the Linux from scratch procedure. So let's tidy that up. And move on to said. So said is reasonably straightforward to install. So that's the configuration done. Let's now build the package itself. Generate some documentation. And we can now test the package. First, we change everything to be owned by the tester user. And then we switch user to the tester and run the check. Okay, so we've got um, all passes. Basically, there's no fails. There's some tests that have been skipped. Um, it could be, for example, this looks like it might be 32-bit, possibly. It might be why those have been skipped. Uh, but generally, skips and not really anything to worry about, unless you've got loads of them. That could indicate that something's broken. Uh, but the fact is, there's no failure, so that's, that's the main issue uh, to look out for. So let's now make install. And install a couple of 
well, a directory and a file into that new directory. And that's it. So let's now tidy set up and move on to PSMISC. So this looks like a very straightforward. These are the basic commands we use to compile a package. And looks like there's no test suite either. So that's the package configured for building. We now run make. That's it complete. And we install it. And that's done. Nice and simple. And now we move on to get text. So get text. First of all, we prepare the compilation by running the configure command. Okay, now that's configured, let's build it.
Okay, so that is built. I'm going to run make check to run some tests. It says it takes about three SPUs, which is probably going to be around about five minutes. Okay, well that was uh, a lot quicker than five minutes, so maybe there's been some parallelism introduced into the test, possibly. But anyway, we've got no failures. The tests that have run have all passed, so that's all good. So let's now install the package. change the permissions on a file so that's get text now move on to bison and again fairly straightforward instructions looks like this takes a while to build 8.7 SBUs um, and five and a half of those as tests but as we've seen with get text it may be a little bit less than that with any luck Okay, let's build it. Well, that was uh, a lot quicker than I thought it would be. Uh, maybe the test will be quick as well then. So let's run make check. Wait for that to finish.
Okay, so let's finish testing and all the tests that ran were successful. Um, it took a little bit more than 5.5 .5 SBUs. I'd say it's probably more like 6 or maybe 7 even. Uh, but never mind, it's in total, it probably is about 8.7 SBU this has taken to build. So for um, what apparently is a smaller package, there's certainly a lot of work to be done for it. So that is Bison installed. Let's tidy that up and move on to the next one, which is Grab. So we start by configuring the package for compilation. Now we build the package. Test the results. And that's completed. We've got 192 passes, no failures. So let's go ahead and install grep and that's done. So now we move on to bash. So once again, we start by configuring the package to prepare it for compiling. And let's actually build it now. And that's finished building. So now let's prepare for testing by making all the files owned by tester, the tester user. And then we copy all of this as one command, paste it in and wait for the testing to complete. And how many SPUs we've got for this. So it's approximately maybe a minute or two, two or three maybe.
Okay, so that's all the testing finished. Let's now install the package. So that's bash installed. And the last command here allows us to run the bash binary that we've just created rather than the one we created in the temporary environment. So we're now running what we've just built. So let's tidy up. Move on to libtool. So we've got one and a half SBUs here. So again, it's about three minutes roughly. Let's configure the package. Oh, I'll tell you what, let's uh, change into it correctly. That's better. Configure it. And build it. That was quick. Now it says here the testing time for libtool can be reduced significantly on a system with multiple cores. To do this, append this text here to the line above. So what we'll do is we'll copy, make, check, space, and then test flags equals. Now we could put in minus JN, but because we've got the make flag set, we could actually cheat and do something like this. And that should resolve to the minus J4 because that's what make flags equals. In fact, let's prove this. If we do um, echo quotes, I'll copy that command in between the quotes for the echo, close the quotes, and you can see it's substituted the value of make flags into the command and you can see that matches exactly with what I suggest putting in. So let's do that now. And I guess I could just to confirm it is using all the cores and it's working correctly. Run top here and you can see there's four libtool commands running and currently one's just dropped off. Oh, it's down there now. So that does look like that is working. Okay, we've got three failures there, but the text does say that five tests are known to fail in the LFS environment due to a circular dependency, but all tests pass if rechecked after automake is installed. So I'm going to do exactly the same as what I'm going to do with ACL is that I'm going to leave the source directory here. I'm not going to remove it afterwards um, when this has been installed. And I'm going to see if it is just a reliance for testing on auto make or if the compilation, the actual building of libtool needs auto make. Um, if it doesn't change the results just by rerunning the test, then I'll rebuild libtool um, and then retesting should get rid of those failures. But we'll see that when, when it happens. Uh, when we come back around to it.
Okay, so there you go. We've got um, 58 expected failures, 63 fails. So that is a difference of five. So that's exactly what the book suggests will happen. So as I say, I'm going to rerun this after Automake has been installed. I've just got to check which one it was for ACL. I think it's, yeah, Core Utils. So uh, let's now install libtool uh, as it is and also remove a useless static library okay so that's libtool done for now like I said I'm not going to delete that I'll leave it as it is I'll just check I've still got the ACL one there I think yeah there's the libtool one and there's ACL to revisit the testing. And if the test pass after those dependencies have been installed, then I don't need to rebuild it or reinstall it. So now let's move on to GDBM. And as usual, start by configuring the package. Okay, that's prepared. So now let's build it. That's fine. Let's run some tests. And install it. That's GDPM done. Now move on to GPerf. And we start again by configuring the package ready for building. and build it with make and run some tests now you can see we've got a minus j1 being given to make to tell it to run run the checks in one thread so that's basically telling make to ignore the setting we've got with make flags and just use one thread to run the tests so they've passed but the looks of it there's no errors there's also nothing to say that there's a path a pass but at least there are no errors so we'll carry on and install and that's it looks like there's very little installed there so that's gperf done And we move on now to expat. And again, we start with configure. Make to build it. Make check to test it. That's all successful. So let's install it and also install some documentation. And that's expat done. So now move on to INET utils. And 
got rather a large configure here, looks like to disable some features mostly. Again, I'm skipping through just typing the commands to show you how I build this correctly. Obviously, if you're learning about this, you would want to read to find out what the options are and what they do to read the descriptions. Not only that, to read you know what the package does and maybe even what some of the programs do that have been compiled by these instructions. So just to emphasize that Linux from scratch is not just a case of copying and pasting. So make to build the package. And make check to run the tests. So they've all passed the ones that have run. Install the package. And it looks like we change the location of one program. And that's our net utils done. Now we move on to less. And prepare it for compilation with this configure command. Build it. And install it as well. And that's done. Tidy it up and now move on to Perl. So Perl's got 9.4 SBUs, so it's um, obviously a slightly bigger package. So first of all, we've got two environment variables that need to be set. And it says that to have full control over the configuration, uh, for the preparation of compiling Perl, you can remove the DES options from the following command and it allows you to handpick the way that it's built. Um, I think it asks you questions, otherwise using DES will um, create some sensible defaults. Um, I imagine, I've never run the configure without the DES commands, but I imagine there's some questions in there that would be probably meaningless to me, so um, I guess it's something you could try to see how you get on. But I suppose to guarantee a successful Linux from scratch build, you probably want to just use the DES option to accept what are probably very same defaults. Okay, that's interesting. So I, I thought this in the first part, it seems the SBUs uh, were really very accurate. Um, but here is clearly a, a discrepancy. I've, I've got the feeling that these SBUs in this uh, chapter eight weren't as accurate. We've got an approximate build time of 9.4 SBUs, which is, um, I believe, supposed to include the testing. But then under the testing bit, it says that they take approximately 11 SBUs. So that's uh, clearly not been updated. So maybe there's some more work for chapter eight to be done um, with the SBUs. So it could be, um, I'm guessing, in total, maybe 20 SBUs. So we'll see how how long this takes. That would equal roughly 40 minutes in total. Um, so let's see how long the time takes. Uh, sorry, the make takes, the builder package. Um, I guess this is going to be about 15 minutes. So let's see. We can identify exactly what's going on here.
Okay, well that was a lot quicker than I expected, so let's now run the tests and see how long that actually takes.
OK, so testing's finished. Looks like that's 1200 seconds, which is at 20 minutes or so. Um, and that's roughly ties up with the SPU's quoted. So it um, seems like that bit's um, fairly accurate. So let's now install the package. Okay, and just unset the two variables that have been used and tidy up. So now we move on to XML parser, which is a Perl module. So again, this the Python this file will begin with a capital letter. So XM. It's important to type it in if you're also completing or even if you're just typing it by hand and you won't find a file to type, I won't find the file if you just type it in. Like case, because of course Linux is case sensitive. So to start building this, we run Perl against a Perl script and build it with make. Test the results and install module. And that's complete. So now we move on to Intel tool. Got a fix using the set command to make the program compatible with newer versions of Perl. Configure command to prepare the build. Now I build it. That's very quick. Test the results. One test, one pass. That's fine. Install the package and install some documentation, and that's complete. And now move on to autoconf. And this is quite a quick build, but the tests take a little bit longer, as you can see there. So it's probably about 10, 11 minutes. So we start with the configuration. Build package. And make check. And again, it says here where we can use the make check with the test suite flags option. Edited to the line above. So once again, I'll do what I did before. Quotes to the make flags. This obviously make this make flags only really work if you did set the make flags at the beginning of the build. If it didn't, if you didn't set it, I'm um, not quite sure what would happen. But um, if you didn't set it, then you would have to put in minus j and the number of cores you want to run the tests on. So we'll just wait a few minutes for that to complete.
Okay, so tests are finished. Um, looks like we've got no failures. 56 was skipped for some reason. But the ones that ran have all passed, so that's good. So let's now install autoconf. And that was it. Tidy up. And that's done. So we're moving on to auto make. And this is a quick one, but again, it's uh, quite a while for the tests. So let's run the configure to prepare the build. And run make. And it says to actually specify the minus J4 to speed up the test. Um, so I have an interest, I'm going to run make check without that to see if it does actually run and pick up make flags. Let's have a look at the top. Okay, at the moment it looks like it's running several things at once. Yeah, there's three things running there. But there might just be spawned events, uh, spawned programs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to abandon that. Run the minus J4. Again, we could put in the dollar make flags if that's set instead. It would have exactly the same effect. Um, yeah, this looks like it's whizzing through a little bit quicker, actually. No, I can't really discern that there's any difference actually. So whether it was picking up the J4 from make flags automatically or not. Oh no, there seems to be a few more there. And it's hard to tell, there's no consistent no, this is probably running about the same speed actually. So whether the so the multi threading occurs within each test rather than it running um tests in parallel. Um, I was just saying some of the days in individual tests, so maybe why looking at top doesn't really help because it's within an individual test. So I'll leave this to run anyway. Wait, um, it looks like it's going to be about 10 15 minutes for this to complete.
Okay, so those tests have finished and we've got no failures, we've got some unexpected um, or sorry, expected failures, so that's not a problem. Uh, but yeah, there's no failures, a few skips, but um, tests that were run that were expected to pass have passed. So that's good. It does say that one test is known to fail, but um, under what conditions is not mentioned, but it's obviously passed on this system. So that's all right. So install that package and just tidy up. So auto make was a dependency for the test of libtool. So I'm going to go back to libtool. In fact, I didn't keep that tab open. So I'll just jump back here and go back to the directory and rerun make check and I'll just quickly put it in my J4 this time and see what results we get okay I just realized I think I put in the wrong command to run this yes I did um, Wondering why this was taking so long. I just realized that uh, I've omitted to put this variable in. So I'm going to rerun this now and hopefully it will run a little bit quicker.
Okay, so that has clearly made a difference because there's no um, errors now. So just rerunning the test, didn't need to recompile um, libtool at all. So that's fine. I'm just going to tidy up libtool and get rid of that tab and carry on with the next package which is open SSL okay so let's prepare for the build successfully configured now let's run make to build the package itself Right, so that's compiled. Let's run the tests.
Okay, so we've got all tests successful, result pass. So that's good. It does suggest one test may fail depending on the kernel settings. So obviously that didn't um, happen. So let's carry on with the installation. Okay, and rename the documentation directory so it's got a version number and copy in some additional documentation. And that should be it. It says there about updating up an SSL with a new version that fixes vulnerabilities announced. Um, but if this is just purely an educational process, we're installing it not to keep, then it's probably not too much to worry about. Okay, so let's move on to KMOD now. So, quick package to install. Let's start with the configure. Build it. Now it says the test suite. This package requires the raw kernel uh, headers, not the sanitized versions. So that's beyond the scope of LFS. So let's just go ahead and install the package. Make some sim links and another sim link. So there's an example of where I've missed the beginning of the command. That's better. So I tidy up and move on to installing libelf, which is part of elf utils. So we extract elf utils and this configure will set up the sources for building. Now we build, El build Elf Utils.
Okay, that's built. Let's run the tests. And we've got all passes there, so that's fine. So now we just install the libelf part that we need. <clears throat> and that's libelf completed. So now we move on to libffi. It says similar to GMP libffi builds with optimization specific to the processor in use. If building for another system, change the value of the with GCC arch parameter in the following command to an architecture name fully implemented by the CPU on that system. If it's not done, all applications are linked will, with or linked to libffi will trigger legal, legal operation errors. So let's copy that in. So that's done. Now let's build the package. That's done. Run some tests.
Okay, so that seems to have passed. There's no errors. So let's now install it. And that's libffi complete. And now move on to Python. So if you remember previously when we installed Python, the package begins with a capital P. So in case you're wondering why, if you type in just the lowercase p, why the package can't be found, that's probably the reason why. So let's begin by configuring the package for building. And let's build the package now with make and wait for it to complete. Looks like there might be a few minutes.
Okay, so that's finished building. Now it says running tests at this point are not recommended. The tests are known to hang indefinitely in a part of LFS from environment. And if desired, the test can be run or rerun at the end of this chapter when Python 3 is reinstalled in BLFS. Now, um, when I have run the tests at the end of the LFS installation, like at the end of this chapter, um, I've always seemed to have an error or two it's never been a perfect run yet there's no mention of those um, however I've carried on anyway and when I have built LFS there doesn't seem to be any apparent problems but again I'm going to leave this directory here um, I'll make a note to come back um, to rerun or to run the tests and see what results get this time so I'm going to install the package now. So um, there's some information there, quite detailed information about running pip and some side effects and so on. Um, saying about pip three. Um, and some warnings which can be suppressed by running the following commands um, what's this say here in LFS BFS we normally build and install Python modules with the pip3 command please take care that the pip3 install commands in both books should be run as a root user unless it's for a Python virtual environment Okay, that's kind of contradicting what this warning here just said. But it does say running pip3 installed as a non root user may seem to work fine, but will cause the install module to be inaccessible by other users. Um, so that's probably not a problem if you're just following instructions in Linux from scratch and beyond the Linux from scratch. So I'll go ahead and put this in to suppress these warnings. Um, and install some pre-formatted documentation as well. That looks like that's it for Python. So let's tidy that up and move on to wheel. So this is a new package. I uh, don't know anything about it, never heard of it before. Um, and the description doesn't really tell me much anyway because um, I don't know much about Python. Perhaps it makes more sense to you. So they're actually using pip3 here to install this. Um, so it's, um, is this really what Linux from scratch is about? Just installing modules? I'm not sure. I would have thought this would have been compiled, but as I say, I don't know much about this, so I can't really comment on that. So that seems to be done. So now let's tidy this up. And move on to Ninja. Now Ninja is one of two packages that's not strictly required um, for an OpenRC or a SysV init um, installation, which this is. Um, it's compulsory for systemd, um, but it is needed for several packages in the BLFS book. So I normally do install this and the next package, Meson, uh, just so that that capability is there even though it's not actually required for just the LFS installation which is what we're doing here it's not actually used by anything else in LFS uh, for the OpenRC stroke SysV init um, version um, now 
this bit here, it says about exporting a variable called Ninja Jobs equals four. And it says here, the reason why they've mentioned this is when Ninja normally runs maximum number of processes, it, sorry, it normally runs maximum number of processes in parallel. By default, this is number of cores on the system plus two. So in my case, it would be six. Um, in some cases, this can overheat a CPU. Well, yeah, I'm not sure about that so much. If, if you've got a CPU that's overheating, then the cooling's not adequate. Um, or run the system out of memory. That's probably, to me, more of a concern. Um, if run from the command line, passing a JN command parameter will limit the number of parallel processes, but some packages embed the execution of Ninja and do not pass the J parameter. So using, using the optional procedure below allows the user to limit the number of parallel processes within a variant variable Ninja jobs. For example, setting Ninja jobs equals four will limit, limit Ninja to four parallel processes. So although um, Ninja is not used in this environment, there's no harm in setting this now. As I say, it won't be used, um, but I tend to just uh, use it anyway. It's not permanent as well, so the next reboot, that will get lost. So it might be something you want to add to um, one of the startup files. So we'll add the capability to, well, let's actually extract Ninja first of all. Before we do anything else. And now we can run these commands here, or this command rather, to add this capability to the source code. And then we build Ninja by running this command here. Okay, so that's built. Now let's run some tests. So that looks like maybe that was compiling the tests. And this looks like this actually runs the tests. And that looks like that says pass. So let's install the package now with these three install commands. That's done. So let's tidy up and move on to Meson now. Again, as I said before, this is one of the two packages that is not required for an OpenRC um, sysv init type installation, but we'll install it anyway because if you do go on to install packages from LFS, you've got Meson already installed. So that's the compilation done. All we need to do now is to install the package. So this install command goes right off the end here. So I've got to make sure I'm just going to maximize the window just to ensure I've copied all of that and I have. So it looks like it just fit in there. So I'll just paste that. It has completed with the end of that. So that's 
fine. And then this final install command. And that's meson installed. So now let's move on to core utils. Okay, so this is a package that's got the patch file. So we put the full stop in to let the autocomplete work correctly. And the first thing we do is to install the patch. And now we can prepare core utils for compilation. Okay, there's the actual compile command now. Oh, sorry, configure command. Okay, let's build a package now with make and wait for it to complete. Okay, that's completed. So now we're going to run some tests. And first we'll run the tests that are meant to be run as the root user. And they've all passed. So now we're going to run some tests which are meant to be run as a um, an unprivileged user. So we have to make change to the group, then we change ownership of the files to tester. And now we can run those tests as an unprivileged user. It does say here that one test is known to fail with GCC 12. So that's the only test we'll expect to, uh, yeah, only failed test we'll expect to see.
Right, so those tests have all passed, that's good. Um, obviously didn't get this failure, but it does say it's known to fail, it doesn't say it will fail. So obviously we've got a system that's uh, a bit more robust here perhaps. So remove the temporary group, install the package. And move some programs around. And that's core utils finished. So what I'm going to do now is go back to ACL and rerun the tests for that. And because that required core utils to be on the system. So let's run make check on the existing build that we've actually installed and see how this goes. And that's a pass, so that's good. That's shown that what we built previously, both with ACL and LibTool was all good, even though we didn't have all the dependencies to prove that it was a good build. So I can now remove ACL. I'll shut this tab down and we can move on to check next. Let me just check to make sure I've got no other directories, source directories that I've forgotten to remove and no I haven't. So let's extract check from the archive and start configuring it ready for building. Okay, let's compile it. And run some tests. It says they take about 3.6 SBUs. So that's going to be about five minutes.
Okay, so that's obviously all passed. There's no errors. Uh, so now let's install the package. And let's check complete. And let's move on to diffutils. Okay, so straightforward installation this, basic installation commands, run the configure. and start building it. And run some tests. Okay, that's all passed. Let's now install Diffutils and that's complete. Tidy up and move on to the next package, Gork. So once again, fairly straightforward installation few little tweaks needed such as this set command so we'll configure the build now compile the package and run some tests. And install it. So that's complete. And we've got a couple of commands here to install some documentation. And that's complete. So now move on to find utils. So we need to prepare find utils for compilation with this command here. And as you can see, again, it's doing two different things depending on whether the architecture of the processor is 32 bit or 64 bit. Um, and this is the actual configure command effectively. So rather than worry about which one is the correct one to run, we'll let the computer decide that and it will automatically pick out the correct configure command. And now let's compile the package with make. And 
assess the results. Again, we change the ownership to a non-privileged user tester. Then we change that user and run the tests. And that is complete. So all past the ones that have run. Let's now install the package. And let's find your tools done. And move on to the next package, which is Groff. So um, with Groff, we configure a page size um, for the Euro, uh, well, for the United States, letter is appropriate, but elsewhere, such as in Europe and probably many other countries, um, A4 is the standard page size. So I'll set that to A4 and configure the package to build. So this package does not support parallel builds, so we have to supply the minus J1, dash day J1. So it will take a little longer than it could have done, but not too long. And that's built, there's no test suite, so we just install the package with make install. And that's complete. So tidy up Groff, and we move on to the next package, which is Grub. So let's extract it. So as it says there, if your system has UEFI support and you wish to boot LFS with UEFI, you can skip this package in LFS and install Grub with UEFI support and its dependencies following the BLFS page at the end of this chapter. Um, so as I say, this machine hasn't got UEFI um, and I tend to just install the basic LFS anyway. So I will be installing this, obviously, because I have to. Um, but this is only the package we're installing here. We're not actually running Grub to embed the boot code into the disk. So another thing that's worth pointing out, I don't think they mention it here. Um, if you have got C flag set, any optimizations, disable them because Grub is very picky about um, 
booting with optimizations. Um, several times I've built this with optimizations and wondered why when Grub's booted it's not work, it tends to just hang. Um, and you think, well, you know, what configuration have I done wrong? And the configuration's correct. What it is is the Grub hasn't been compiled correctly. Um, and it's probably because it's very low level, the code that's um, running to make Grub work. So ensure that you've got C flags, CXX flags, any, any other optimizations uh, disabled before you build this package. It is very sensitive. So just let it build with the standard defaults. So we'll start by configuring the package. And we'll start the building with the make command. Okay, that's built. Um, as it says there, there is a test suite, but it's not recommended to run it as there are a lot of packages that have been installed that it relies on. So it's not recommended. We'll just go straight and install it. And move one file, the looks of it. And as it says there, I mentioned previously that we haven't made the system bootable yet. We'll be doing that a little bit later in the configuration stage. So let's now tidy up and move on to GZIP. So again, it's one of these packages that's pretty basic in terms of Installation commands, straightforward configure. The make to build it. And then let's run a few tests with uh, didn't copy properly, did it? Uh, make check, run some tests. <clears throat> Okay, all passed, that's good. Let's now install gzip and that's done. Tidy it up and we'll move on to the next package, which is IP root. In fact, IP root 2. So we make some changes for the reasons mentioned in that paragraph there. And we start the build with this command.
and we install the package. There's no test suite that's working. And then we just copy a couple of files, or several files rather. And that's IP root done. So next package KBD. Okay, it's another one with a patch. Yes, it is. So let's run this patch in. And then we've got some said commands to make some adjustments. And now we can prepare it for compilation with this configure command. <clears throat> and build it. So now let's test what we've built. And that says that all the tests were successful, which is good. And now install it and some additional documentation. There is a note there about certain languages that KBD doesn't provide a useful key map for. So um, it says that if you have one of those languages, then you'll have to download separate working key maps. So that's KBD done. Uh, sorry. Yeah, KBD. And we move on now to lib pipeline. And again, this looks like a straightforward standard configure make make check and make install okay let's compile it test it all passed and install it and that's done and now we'll move on to make again standard build commands Let's build it with make. And run some tests, which will probably take a minute or two. So that says no failures and a little smiley, so that's good. We can go ahead and install the package and tidy up and move on to patch. Again, the similar or same straightforward configure make, make check and make install. So 
So let's now build it. And run some tests. Level passed. There's one skip, two um, expected failures. So install the package and let's complete. So now we move on to tar. So pair it for compilation with this command here. Okay, so now let's build tar and wait for it to finish. And let's run some tests. It does say one may fail, but it depends on how the kernel's been configured. So we'll just have to see what happens.
Okay, so we have got a failure. It says 218 were run, 20 were skipped, and one failed unexpectedly. So let's check. It says it's the binary store stroke restore. Um, it's known to fail because LFS lacks SE Linux, but we skipped if the host kernel does not support extended attributes, which I'm, I'll bet it does. Um, so let's look for that. Or did it actually say at the end? Come to think of it. Um, I suppose we could look at the test suite.log, might be an idea. Oh, it's in tests. So let's look for the word binary. There it is there. Yeah, summary of failures. So it was test 227. It doesn't actually say explicitly it's failed, but it's under the failed tests section in the same way that all these tests have been skipped. Um, oh, here's some details there showing it's testing binary store restore. Uh, doesn't mean a lot to me, but anyway, that looks like, as far as LFS is concerned, that's a successful test um, because that one failure is accounted for. So let's go ahead and run make install and install some documentation by the looks of it. And tidy up. So now we move on to text info. And we start off with a configure command. And now we build a package with make. Okay, now let's run some tests. And that looks like that's all passed. So we shall now install the package. And as optionally you can install components belonging to a tax installation. So I usually run this as well. And that was quick. Um, it says occasionally um, problems in the make files of various packages can sometimes get out of sync with info pages installed in the system. And if the user share info dir file ever needs to be created, the following optional commands will ins uh, accomplish, accomplish this task. So we could run that now. Um, probably won't do a lot. But that's obviously rebuilding the, uh, the uh, files there. So we'll tidy up text info and move on to Vim. Okay, 
So if Vim or Vi is not your preferred editor, there are other ones that are detailed in the BLFS book if you wish to install one of those instead. Um, however, this is the standard for Linux from scratch. So I'll go ahead and install this. So we'll start with the configure there. Now we'll build it. Okay, that's completed. So now we're going to test it. We need to change ownership of all the files to uh, the tester non-privileged user. And then we run the test with this command. And you can see that um, everything gets output to the log file called Vim test. So there won't be any output and we'll just search that at the end to look for all done to prove that the tests were successful.
Okay, so that's finished. So what we need to do now is grep for the text all done in the file vim test.log. And you can see it's responded. That means it's found that text. So that shows that the tests were successful. So let's install vim. And then we've got some commands here to allow us to run Vim as a program called Vi, which is the traditional name for the visual editor. And this just adjusts the documentation. Configuring Vim. So by default, Vim runs in via incompatible mode. This may be new to users who have used other editors in the past. The no compatible setting is included below to highlight the fact that a new behavior is being used. It also reminds those who would change to compatible mode that it should be the first setting in the configuration file. This is necessary because it changes other settings and overrides must come after this setting. Create a default Vim creation configuration file by running the following. So we'll just copy all of this paste that in and that should be that done and you can get more options available by running that command and there's some information about spelling languages there and how to install other spell files so that's vim we now move on to eu dev Build this starting with this configure command. And now let's actually compile it with make. Okay, that's all built. So now let's install it. Create a couple of, uh, sorry, we'll test it first. Create a couple of directories that are needed for tests. And now we'll run the test with make check. And that's complete, all successful. Let's run the installation. Store some rules that the LFS team have provided by the looks of it, and run that in. Configuration information about hardware devices is maintained in the etcu dev hardware database d and user lib udev hardware database d directories. EU dev needs an inf that information to be compiled into the binary database. Create the initial database with this. And this command needs to be run each time hardware information is updated. So if you move on to BLFS, this might be something you want to add to a cron job to run, say, once a week to keep the database up to date. Apart from that, that's EU dev configured and built and installed. So now we move on to man db. And we start with this configuration file, uh, configuration command.
we can compile it with make. And run the check. So those tests look all successful, so I'll just install it. And that's done. So there's a bit here about installing non-English manual pages in Linux from scratch. And it's showing you what the expected character encoding of legacy 8-bit manual pages are for different languages. So if that's important to you, you might want to take a note of that. Uh, any other pages in languages not in the list aren't supported. So that's that. Okay, so we're getting towards the home run of the uh, compilation stage. So nearing the end of chapter eight, we've only got a few more packages left. So the next one we've got is proc psng. So this package used to extract into, I think it was just proc ps and then the version number, but now it's actually extracting into a directory name that's exactly the same as the package name. So let's run the configure command. Run make to compile it. And run make check to test it. It does say that one test may fail with if some application applications with a custom memory allocator are running on the host distro. So um, although we've got a web browser, I'm not sure if there's a JVM running or not. Uh, but obviously it's, there's no problem anyway because we've got a pass. So let's install that and tidy up. And move on to Util Linux. So we've got a huge configure command here, disabling a lot of functionality, probably because the yeah, it says here. Um, to prevent warnings about building components that require packages that are not in LFS or inconsistent with programs installed by other packages. So maybe a conflict, maybe. Okay, so that's configured the build. Let's now run make to build it. Okay, so that's built. Now there's a warning there about running the test as um, the root user can be harmful, but I suggest a way around it. So I'm not going to do that. It involves recompiling the kernel. So just going to run it as a non privileged user. We start by changing the ownership of all the files to the non privileged user tester and then running the test as the tester user.
Okay, so we've got two tests that have failed unusually because it does only mention oh hard link tests, so maybe there's two hard link tests. Um, in fact, that's not what's failed unusually. So there could be this mentions something that's not set in the kernel for the hard link test, so maybe that is set in this kernel. It could be there's something else not set in the kernel which is causing these to fail. I'm not sure what they are. Um, but I would say that that's probably okay to carry on. It's just two tests. It's not a, um, a load of tests that has failed. So that's slightly unusual, but I'll, yes, I'll accept that and just go ahead and make install. So that's Util Linux built, uh, tidy up and move on to E2FS progs. So this recommends building in a separate build directory, which we'll create and change into. Configure the build. Start the build with make. Okay, so let's run some tests. It says one test may fail. Okay, so that has actually passed all tests, no failures. So we'll install the package. Remove some static libraries. And it says um, we need to run these commands in because it installs a gzip info file but doesn't update the system wide dir file. So that I imagine is what these commands do. And then install some extra documentation with these commands. And that's E2FS procs completed. Now move on to sysklogd. And we've got a couple of sets here. Pop 
compile the package. And install it. No test suite, and that's done. So configuring it, we've got this config file to create. So we'll just copy and paste all of that, paste it in, and that's done. Tidy it up, and move on to sysv init, which is the last package. Ironically, this is the first program that runs the boot up after Grub hands over to the operating system, or rather after the uh, kernel hands over to the operating system. So we'll extract that and apply the patch, run make. And finally, make install. And that's sysfree and it done. So, next section about debugging, or next chapter, next, yeah, next page, um, says about uh, the fact that some programs compiled with debugging sim symbols. Um, it gives examples of how much space um, is used by these debugging symbols. And because most users never use debug on the system software, a lot of disk space can be regained by removing these symbols. This next section so shows how to strip all these debugging symbols from programs and libraries. Now, this section is optional. Um, if the user is not a programmer and does not plan to do any debugging system software, you can decrease the size by about, by about two gigabytes, which is a you know, fair size. Um, it causes no inconvenience other than not being able to debug the software fully anymore. Um, most people who use commands below do not experience any difficulties. However, it is easy to make a typo and render the system unusable. So before running the strip commands, it's a good idea to make a backup of the LF system in its current state. A strip command with strip unneeded option removes all the debug symbols from binary or library and it removes all symbol table entries not needed by the linker or the dynamic lim linker. Um, note that strip will overwrite the binary or library file it is processing. This can crash the processes using the code or data from the file. If the process running strip itself is affected, the binary or library being stripped can be destroyed and can make the system completely unusable. To avoid it, we'll copy some libraries and binaries into temp, strip them there, and then install them back with the install command. And read the related entry there for the rationale to use the install command here. Um, the elf loader's name is LD Linux. Um, x64 x8664.so2 and 64 systems and ld linux.so2 on 30 bit on 32 bit systems the construct below selects the correct name for the current architecture excluding anything ending with a g in the case in case the commands below have already been run now um normally this does run without any problems um but uh, there has been the odd occasion where I have run this and it has trashed everything that I've created. So what I've done is I've got a spare hard disk, but um, a USB drive with enough space uh, for the image should be sufficient. So what I'm going to do is... Um, First of all, go to the root of the live CD. So this session's not within the truth of the LFS system. First thing I'm going to do is I'll connect the disk I've got. And that should appear. There it is there. So I've got 500 gig disk. It's more than enough. Um, the 
disk within the computer that we've been building LFS on is only 250 gig anyway, and LFS itself is um, probably only no more than 10 gig, say. Um, although what I'm going to do is take a disk image, so and I'm going to lightly compress it just for speed. So it does mean if there are any uh, sectors within the disk that are not very compressible, it does mean it could end up with a, still quite a large file. So it's something to bear in mind if you do do this. But in theory, if it was a completely erased disk, the work that we've done, it shouldn't be particularly big. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how big it is. I, I don't expect it to be too big. Bearing in mind, though, there was Windows on there, and all we did was overwrite Windows, so there could be bits of the Windows left lying around on other parts of the disk, so that that probably get um, backed up. But archiving the disk in this way, backing up sector by sector, is going to be far easier in terms of backing up and far easier in terms of restoring it if we need to. Uh, it's just the quickest, me quickest method to do it, although, as I say, it does need a little bit more disk space. So as you can see on my backup disk, uh, it's uninitialized. So I need to create um, a partition on it. So similar to what we did when creating the um, LFS partitions, I'm going to use F disk on that drive. And I'm going to create a new partition primary default one first sector and then I'm going to use all the disk just display that there it is there write that out and there it is there so now I need to format it with a file system so e2fs uh, no sorry mkfs dot ext4 and it's the backup drive. So it says that it seems that there's, oh, no, that's not correct. It's the partition I want to put the file system on, not the disk itself. I thought that was a bit unusual being as it was a completely blank disk. So there we go, it's just creating the, now this will be a little bit slow because although the USB device is a USB 3, that as I said before, this computer's only got USB 2. Uh, ports in it. I'm pretty sure they are anyway. So it could take a little while. And it's a mechanical disc as well, so it's another thing to slow it down a little bit. Okay, that's all good. So you can see the Gen 2 system has recognized it as a, a valid device to mount. So what I'm going to do now is to make somewhere for it to reside. So under mount, uh, I'll call it backup and I'll mount dev sdc1 at that location. So if we now take a look at that, we've got a new disk with a partition of just over 435 gigabytes. So the next thing we've got to do is to undo all the setup we've got for Linux from scratch, unmount all the file systems so that we've got the bare system um, and then uh, unmount the partitions and then back up the drive then redo all that and re-enter the truth and then we can get on with the um, stripping knowing that if something does go wrong um, we've got a backup now as I say most of the time nearly every time I've done this it's not been a problem but there's been once maybe twice where it's just trashed everything. And I'm not sure if it's something I've done, um, something in the way that I've compiled Linux from scratch, I'm not, I'm not sure. So rather than risk losing all this work, uh, so that's why I'm gonna do a backup. So the first thing we're gonna do is to do Control D 
to come out of the trout. I now need to look at the mount to see what I need to unmount and basically it's going to be anything under MNT LFS. So I could try doing a mount minus R slash MNT slash LFS. Uh, sorry, you mount. So it still says LFS is busy and that's because this user is actually in that hierarchy that I'm trying to unmount. So I'll just go back to mount, retry that. And that seems to have worked. So if I'll just double check. Yep, that looks okay. The, the most recent mounts are always at the end of that list. And I can just verify that by passing it through grep and looking for LFS. And there's nothing there. So I know now that the internal drive of the PC is completely unmounted. Um, so... So that's that disk there, uh, sorry, that disk there is where we've been building Linux from scratch and it's now not mounted at all, but I've got that my backup drive mounted. So that's where I'm going to start doing my um, backup and I'll do it in this window or yeah, this tab here, this window here. So let's change into the backup directory. Let's do an F disk minus L just so we've got a reminder of what devices we're using. So it's dev SDA, and I'm going to back up the whole of this disk. So I'll time this, see how long it takes. I'm going to use DD to copy the disk. The input file for the stream is slash dev slash SDA. So that's where the data is coming from. That's the device I'm backing up. The output file is going to be an actual file within MNT backup. So I'll call it something like backup of um, LFS 11.2.disk. Uh, sorry, that should be an equals. And I'll set a block size of 64K is normally quite reasonable. Uh, I'll keep forgetting to put these equals in and I'll do a status uh, equals progress just so we get some feedback on the copying and that should be it. Now that will copy a raw image so that the file it will produce will be exactly the same size as the disk. Um, if you want to compress it, if you're limited for space, um, what you can do is to modify this command so that we'll keep the um, file name part. I'll get rid of this now. And we can we'll keep the block size the same and the status the same. We can pipe this through gzip. I'll set it to minimal compression so it's the fastest. And then I'll also specify C so it uses standard out. And then whatever that produces as a compressed stream of data, I'll redirect to a file, which will be our backup file. And it'll be a disk image and I'll put GZ on the end because it will also be compressed with GZIP. So that should be sufficient. So the status will show the status of the uncompressed stream because that's on the input side. GZIP will compress it and then the output from GZIP which will be the compressed stream or the compressed version of this un uh, stream of data that's coming into it will be written to a file. So press enter and you can see it's started off. So it's done a gigabyte in six seconds. So it's gonna be, I'll have to get the calculator out to work that out. Uh, so 
So six seconds times 250 gigabytes is 1500 seconds divided by 60 is 25 minutes. So it's not too, too long. So just wait for that to complete and come back in a short while.
Okay, so that has backed up after 24 minutes, so that was quite a good estimate. Um, what I would normally do is actually uncompress that file and examine it separately, but uh, to save time, I'm not going to do that. But what I will do, yeah, that's the file. It's actually only 4 gig, so that's a good indication that it has only really backed up stuff that we've created on here, on here with LFS and the rest of the disk was indeed blank. Um, what I will do is to just Zcat this file so this will uncompress it and send it to the uh, standard out um, but I'll pass it through OD uh, with the A flag for ASCII and I better do less on that because it will just uh, go straight off the screen and what this will do, it will allow me to examine the bytes that would have been on the disk to see if there's anything recognizable um, to see if what I've compressed, what I've copied and compressed is actually um, something that makes sense. Uh, at the moment I can't really see anything. Um, and now it could be normally I'd expect uh, something in the boot sector, but I guess because you can see the first several hundred bytes are null. Uh, so normally there will be a boot sector there. So that's obviously because we haven't created a boot sector yet. This this disk is not bootable. So what another thing I can do is to use a command called strings um, on that file. Sorry, no, I'll have to say cat it first actually. Pass that through strings, and this will pick out strings. I think by default, anything that's got a string of principal ASCII characters of uh, 16 or more, so a run of characters that are principal, um, a run of 16 characters or more that are principal, it will print out um, what's on this. So if I do that, sorry, strings. Um, hopefully that will find something. Yeah, there's some stuff there. So that looks like Windows, stuff left over from Windows. Um, we've got some other stuff there. This looks like it could be Windows as well. So that tells me or gives me an indication that, yes, what's been backed up um, is uh, valid. It's not a, a direct um, or a good way of uh, being certain, but it seems to be uh, what I've done. I will try something I've never tried before. I don't know if I could pipe this through F disk. Let's try that. No, that doesn't seem to have worked. It's just um, printed up. What F disk has got, but yeah, I'm reasonably certain that that is a good backup of the disk, so that's fine. Uh, so what I shall do is I'll unmount that to ensure that the backup doesn't risk getting spoilt by anything. So that's all unmounted. So I'll just remove that from the system. And what I'm going to do now is go back to this tab here, which as you can see is still the same system. Um, it's just that I've got all the commands on this terminal. Looks like I've got a slightly smaller font on this one. Right. Uh, so what I need to do now is to go back to the home in the book and redo some of the commands to mount the system uh, to mount the virtual file system so I need to go back here so that I can remount these systems here but first of all of course I've got to mount the disk that's internal in fact I didn't turn the swap off did I although that doesn't matter actually uh, the swap's pretty basic in terms of what sort of file system it is. Um, 
Yes, it's still there. And as you can see, it's not been used at all in all compiling we've done, as I suspected. I, I did think it might use a, a few K, but it's not touched it at all, probably because it's got nowhere near to filling up the 16 gigabytes of memory. Um, so not really a problem, but it's not ideal. Uh, it shouldn't cause any problems when we come to, um, if, if we had to restore from the backup. So, right, what I need to do first then is to mount the, let's copy and paste these, make sure I don't make any mistakes. So I need to mount the root file system onto, uh, let's just check how the FS is set, it should be. And this is another reason why I'm using this tab. Yep, it's still set. So mount the root file system at LFS and then mount the boot file system, which hasn't yet got anything in it, but we'll mount it there already. So there's those two mounted. Um, don't think there's anything in boot yet. No, just the lost and found directory for recovery. So that's fine. So now I need to redo these uh, virtual file systems, remount them. And this is important. I think Grub does actually use one or two of these. Um, when we install the bootstrap with grub. So that's the virtual file systems mounted. The next thing we've got to do is to re-enter the truth environment. So because I had make flag set, I'm going to do control R, type in truth. You can see that's recalled the truth command that I used to enter the system. And we're now back to where we were. So if I just go back into sources, you can see there's all the packages there. And if I do a listing of the root, you can see there's the um, file system with all the directories and files that have been created over the last couple of days, September the 1st, September the 2nd, are the dates of those directories. So. In theory, we're back to where we were, except we've got the additional protection of a backup. So I'm going to start by running these commands in now, and um, hopefully there won't be any, any problems, and if there is, then we've got the backup. So let's start by putting in the first command. And we've got a change directory. Then this for statement is a whole command effectively. So we'll copy and paste that all in. It seems to have worked. Then we've got two more variable declarations. And then another for statement to process several commands. And another one. In fact, I should have done a DF before I've done this to see what this space was saved, but never mind. So while that's running, let's see if I've got, yes, I've got one here, or I, no, perhaps not. Uh, all right, mount LFS. So it's three and a half gig, the system beforehand. So let's see what it is afterwards. That seems to have worked. Let's now unset these variables that have been used. And hopefully, We've still got a working system. Right, so according to this inside, 
the truth. We've got 1.6 gig, and I'd expect this to be the same. So it does look like it's about 1.9 gigabytes that's been saved. Yeah, 1.6 gig. So it is a substantial amount of, amount of space that can be saved by doing this. So it may be worthwhile if you are tight, tight on space. And also remember, this includes um, about half a gigabyte of the source packages. So in theory, we've got an LFS system that's just over a gigabyte in size, which is not not too bad size. So now we move on to cleaning up. Let's move back to our truth. And we can remove some temp files that have been created from the tests, from running the tests and some libtool archive files these dot la files we can delete them the compiler built in chapter six and seven is still partially installed and not needed anymore so we can remove that and finally we can remove the tester user Okay, so that's just a warning saying that the mail spool was not found, and that's probably because the tester was created, the tester user was created manually, and that spool was not created. So now, if I do another DF, we'll see how much more space we've saved. Oh, it's not a great deal. Um, it's about a hundred megabytes, so it's a little bit more. Um, not not a fantastic amount though. So next we move on to system configuration.